Yeah, thanks for being here. My name is Olaf. I'm uh, one of the founders. I'm still alive, as I said. A little bit more gray hair. Um, but uh, I think uh, four and uh, some four years and something is counts for something in the startup world. So uh, let me show you what FAM is all about. I put in this little quote because deploying is not releasing. Does that trigger something in you guys? Yeah. Okay. Hopefully, when when I'm done with my slides and my little demo, uh, you agree that releasing is totally something different from technical deploying. Uh, then I'm happy. And I need to name this thing. So uh, DevOps check. Continuous delivery check. Microservices check. Docker. Yeah. <laughs> That's old news, Docker. Yeah. It's still alive. Oh. Kubernetes. <laughs> New stuff. Istio. Who's working with Istio? In production? As of this morning, yes. Congratulations. <laughs> One, <laughs> 1. <laughs> 1. <laughs> 1.02, is it? Or what, That's what an version? assumption. What are you running? What version? I have no clue. Yes. Okay. But that's uh, <laughs> bleeding edge. Very good. I hope not too much blood, but uh, all right. This all cool stuff. Spinnaker. Who's working with Spinnaker? Okay. Uh, okay. We've got all kinds of technologies happening, and that's all nice and dandy. But why? Why are we doing all this stuff? Might be a little bit of a strange question in a. To in keep a, us in busy. A, hmm? To keep us busy. Running. Yeah, to make that's money. one thing. Make money. <laughs> <laughs> but if you would ask uh, little less technical people or more business people, this would be no. We need more to move faster. That's kind of like uh, one thing. But we spoke <coughs> to a few companies that are using CD tooling and they say, yeah, we increased our velocity. It's going really well. We also increased our issues and outages. <laughs> That's not going all too well. <laughs> and it takes us like uh, four hours to push a new version because we need to move forward and we cannot roll back, etc. So what we also want, arrow going down, less issues. Everybody agrees? Yeah? Seems very easy, obvious to do, but I guess you all know it's harder in practice. But a few metrics first. DevOps support. This is an older one. I think the 2081 just got released, but probably the ratios are the same. Um, when you embrace DevOps, whatever that may be, um, the idea is that you cannot increase or improve one dot something, but really like a multiple of what you would normally have when you do it the old way. And these multiples like 200 times shorter lead times and 60 times fewer failures are in itself not, not I mean, they're a vanity for me. Whatever, what, what does it mean, 200 times shorter lead time? Is that an outcome that I want to focus on? It's about this. I think this is really intriguing. It reminds me of the little cartoon where Roadrunner starts like going around this other guy and he only sees like a ball of dust or something and then everything has changed like there's explosives on his feet and that happens in like one millisecond so the idea is that you can learn it's not so much that you move faster because of moving faster you want to move faster because you i not too many managers here i hope when i say fail fast they start getting really like white and angry and oh no failure is not an option in our company <laughs> okay, okay, okay. we never fail but yeah, because we saying it, it doesn't make it true right? no <laughs> but let's say we call it learn faster <laughs> we learn faster same thing but this is i think it's really intriguing if you learn faster fail faster you have multiple times the opportunity of improving which is what you want to know because you don't know in advance how to get to the point that, that you reach like optimums or see a bit. <coughs> then there's this little book or big book. Anybody knows what this yeah. read it? Yeah. Really tough. Starts really like nice and then <laughs> then it's a tough <laughs> model. It's really like what? It's a, but the thing with antifragile is interesting. It's basically um, who have you ever got the flu? 
chicken pox, those things, yeah. your body is anti-fragile because you get resisted. You not only get it and heal, but your body gets resistant because you learn. Your body starts learning. You guys yeah. see the end-to-end -end thing. You learn from it and then you, the next time, hopefully it doesn't happen as often or as severe. So that's important. And why? This is the guy. I think he's the richest guy in the universe right now. Uh, net award of 600 something. My son was asking me, what's the richest guy in the world? Dagobert Duck? No, 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 it's Jeff Bezos. So he was like one, 160,000 million dollar net worth of last week. Or but he does say some interesting stuff. Um, your customers want something and you need to expose it to them so they can learn that they like it and want to use it. And so you need to improve, you need to learn. Otherwise you as a company or a service or, or something, you're not able to serve your customers and somebody else will do. So that's an important aspect. And that's why we say in this technical play with containers and DevOps and all that stuff, we have ops, we have dev, but who of you is sitting with product owners, business people, talking about business? Is the O and Biz DevOps? Yeah, and another. Where you work at the second part? Hmm? Yeah. Andy. Andy. <laughs> often the, the business business people are not involved. So often you basically see rooms of, of engineering types and they're really happy and yeah, we do great, we and develop cool stuff. And then we talk to the product owners or feature manager and how are you, how do you think it's going? Mwah. I need to enter a ticket in some system and then I need to press refresh a thousand times and then hopefully I see something change. So I feel or we feel that, that the business component of DevOps is essential because those are the metrics that you drive your services or your company or your organization with because uh, client success or, or shopping cart values or I mean in the end what, what does it mean when a service runs faster? It needs to achieve something in the end. So I, we believe this is an important thing to apply. Um, and also, and I will stop boring you very soon with all these higher level stuff and just go into the FAMP itself. But the thing is, um, you Innovation is, is really nice. I mean, there's a lot of people talk about we need to innovate more and, and everybody agrees. How, how can you not agree to innovate? Nobody will say, yeah, yeah, we, 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 I don't want to innovate. The thing is, the moment you try out something and it breaks something somewhere and you get somebody from up or whatever and starts cursing at you or starts screaming or there's no way this, this can go down and then there's no fun in innovation anymore because basically you're blocking. Your organization is blocking your power <coughs> of because there's no room for trying and experimentation and, and learning, basically. You're not allowed to learn. It's like giving a kid a bike and say, the only way that you can ride this bike is not falling off. If you fall off, you uh, uh, get the bike out of your eyes and then, so you can never learn it. So this is an important aspect. And then we get to the point where we reach FAB. Who of you is familiar with these kind of canary patterns. You are? Who is applying this into their systems? I'm familiar with that. I'm, I'm not a student. I need to be familiar with that. Okay, yeah, that's good. Anybody else? So, idea is known, but not yeah. in uh, production, not yeah. in development. Yeah. Okay. So, <coughs> just like in test, but not in being. Like okay. Yeah. Or canary, like, right? You are uh, directing your uh, request to version one point one to see yeah. if the things are okay, <laughs> yeah. and then you release that or not, right? Yeah. So basically, this is you need to read this from right to left. Basically, this is from Spotify. They do the same thing. So basically, if you boil it down. And that's why we say deploying is not releasing because when you read like OpenShift or, or Spinnaker or GoCD, they talk about canarying or canary releasing, which is often a rolling release. 
you have a cluster of 100 instances, you go in blocks of 10, you move forward when stuff is green and ready, which is a rolling release, or I should say deploy, when we say releasing is different from deploying, which basically means it's deployed, it's running, in the end it's in my production environment, but now I want to open the doors of my shop, of my, of my office, but not to everybody. Only to people with beards, wearing a red hat, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, having this amount of money in their pocket. They're allowed to go in, and they can try out the things that I thought of, and then I'm going to measure what happens. Observability. If stuff doesn't work out like I planned it should be, then I just close the door again, turn back, and try again. If it works nicely, I increase the amount of people I let in, or different type of people, <coughs> black hats, white hats. No beards, women. But that's the idea. So releasing is basically the process of exposing stuff that is deployed successfully to consumers, either clients, apps, other services, within your conditions, with your percentages, etc. So it's more from the outside in thinking. And that's a big difference, I think. And with FAMP, we all uh, we get a lot of questions like, is it replacing Spinnaker or, or CD tooling? No, it's an extension. You deploy through that kind of tooling. It is going through your DTAP. It's running, it's green. And now you want to control the release, smart releasing. And a canary release, in essence, is like a multi-stage or phased release, where you open it up to a specific range of device, users, geolocations, labels, countries, whatever. Measure, if it works, increase. If it doesn't work, throw it away. You only impact it like the first segment of audience that, that <coughs> hit it. Make sense? So, if you go to Velocity, go to all the conferences, people talk about this stuff. Spotify, Stone, Twitter, Facebook, Booking. So, it seems that it's really cool and everybody should do it, and these companies are high-fiving their way to Agile, testing, release, Nirvana. So, why don't we all do that? Because this is the reality. <laughs> <laughs> it's dirty, it's dangerous, I'm not sure where the floor is here, but... It is, this is, my feeling is that this is our <laughs> daily, daily life. We need to work with the tools that we got, with the people that ask us to fight fires and how to make this thing work. Because there's so much stuff that you need to do. So what we try to do with FAMP is try to make a little bit more sense out of this stuff. So this is another view of the same image. It's cl called the cloud native landscape. I think this is also an earlier version which is now exploded into even more logos. We're in there somewhere around service management, I think. Okay. Anyway, it doesn't really matter. It's, it's exploding tooling-wise, so what to use if you want to do canary releasing. I don't know. It's basically uh, because it, you need to hit a uh, few areas. So if you compare a tool as FAMP, like an automation device, home automation device, um, when you have this this thing like a smart thermostat or nest or it touches a few things it gets temperature data in it can turn on or off or modulate a heater this heater sends uh, water to your uh, radiators it measures if this thing happened what you programmed it and there's a little program inside in essence it's really simple but if you don't have this thing or it doesn't work these separate components don't really add a lot of value. So FAMP, in essence, is an automation system for uh, three main components, deployment tooling, like Kubernetes scheduler or Marathon scheduler. Uh, we control routing, proxies for mesh between services, ingress outside to your endpoints, or edge, like API gateway layers where we do the routing and, and redirection. And there's automation workflows, these little programs that can act upon KPIs or metrics that, that need to be actionable. Those can be uh, technical things like uh, CPU log, memory usage, uh, HTTP statuses, but it can also be more business metrics. 
shopping cart values, uh, latency of my end-to-end -end thing, uh, synthetic tests, um, doesn't really matter. You can pipe those in from external systems or generate them internally. And then if you connect these things together, you get like a loop where you can automate releasing, scaling, uh, rolling forward, rolling back by basically configuring the proxy layer. Hope that makes sense. I will show it and then hopefully. <laughs> um, so what, what, why would you want this? Uh, what, what can you achieve with these kinds of things? Gradual rollout to your downtime, try out new things, move, move traffic over different versions, uh, crossover when you upgrade, uh, dependency chains, so you can have request headers or accept headers and forward those so you can have chains of service versions. You can A-B test everything, basically everything you can configure or, or bake into a container and deploy, you can put in parallel and then measure the goal targets that are relevant for you. Could be anything from configuration changes to new features to what would happen if I give it more memory or run it on a small instead of a large machine or run it in Azure instead of Amazon, see what happens. And basically you can automate this, which is nice because in the end, dry. Don't repeat yourself. This is architecture. You can find this on our website. So uh, if you're interested, just come over to us uh, after the talk or another moment. And uh, we'll be happy to explain a little bit more about how it works uh, technically. But the important thing is we work with Kubernetes. We work with Mesos Marathon or DCS as the distro is called. It's not a single point of failure. Basically, configures proxies, HA proxy based or Istio, and um, then it stops doing what it does. It's like pulling the thermostat from the wall, and basically your heater will keep on running as it was configured at the last moment. So as long as there are one or more proxies up and running, and one or more containers in your in your cluster running, you don't need fab to get traffic from the outside to your services. And it's working with the stuff that you already have, Elasticsearch. Prometheus, HashiCorp Fold, etcd, console, uh, Kubernetes, Marathon, Node.js scripts for workflows, CLIs, APIs. We, we don't try to reinvent the wheel as to tell you that everything you currently use is crap. It's more like an add-on or drop-in replacement for stuff. So for example, in the Kubernetes uh, space, we wrap around the ingress, load balancer, service constructs. So you don't need to change anything or only tiny amounts and it will work. So let me show you um, what time, how much time do we have? Halfway. Halfway. Any questions? Yeah. Uh, are you running Kubernetes on top of Mesos as well? Or um, are you using <laughs> the Mesos scheduler for? Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah that DCS provides a package to, to deploy Kubernetes yeah, yeah. on a message framework. Um, as far as I've seen and the stuff that we tested, it works. I think it's even more scalable because Mesos uh, has been like proven for years now. Yeah. And, uh, in terms of scalability, scale is much better than uh, yeah. when it is so far, at least. Yeah, we're partnering with Mesosphere. We're also close with the Google team that develops Istio and, 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 and with Microsoft. Uh, so yeah, Kubernetes of course gets a lot of hype, and and like like. But before this, it was Mesos yeah, yeah. doing a really good job. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> and you you see that the the Mesos clusters are much bigger and more big data oriented, obviously because of the framework for Mesos like Kafka, Cassandra, Hadoop. Um, but the nice thing is of course that 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 FAMP is multi-tenant and multi-scheduler, mm -hmm. so you can set up multiple environments, one talk to Marathon, one to Kubernetes on the same Mesos framework if you want to or of different clouds, so you can mix and match. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, but yeah, th commercially I think there's a lot of money going around in the DCOS or Mesos Marathon space because of the big data stacks. <coughs> Still powering Twitter, I guess, so uh, there's a yeah. lot of money there. Airbnb is using it, Apple yeah. is using it here, I think it's powered yeah. by that, so there's a lot of uh, traction that goes to DCOS without people knowing because it's not really It's not sexy. <laughs> yeah, it's not advertised as Kubernetes is. But yeah. I've, I've worked with Mesos in the past and I loved every minute of it. It yeah. actually does what it says it does, nothing more. Yeah. Marathon was a bit sketchy back then, but I, yeah. I, I think it got better now. To be honest, I think that at some point probably Marathon will be decommissioned 
or Kubernetes as a scheduling framework, probably. There's also Aurora, which is an alternative for Marathon. Nobody's using that except Twitter, <laughs> Except the guys that develop Aurora. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I mean, I think the, the goal of this stuff is it will change anyway. So you want to make it modular. So important aspect of Fabulous is driver-based. Mm. It's modular. So we have drivers against Kubernetes API, drivers against Docker API, drivers against uh, Marathon API. There's no problem with us. We're currently writing drives for Fargate, Amazon Lambda. The canary patterns apply the, the same, wherever or however you deploy the functionality. It's not really, and maybe in unikernels, I don't know, stuff, stuff, stuff will uh, pop up. So is this like a translator at this point? It translates from your uh, interface? Yeah, from into our, yeah, yeah, okay. yeah that's, that's correct. <coughs> so let me show you. So this is running on DCS, but like I said, we don't really have a preference there. Uh, the Marathon and Kubernetes are both uh, first-class citizens. We have uh, Lifter, which is our installer and configuration manager. So typically what you would do when you want to start playing around with Sand to experience this canary stuff. Um, no, no, it's fine. Yeah, okay, good. Installing Lifter would be sufficient. Either on Kubernetes, we have a like a, a, a general or JSON file for you, or on a Marathon. You hit deploy, it will install all the dependencies like MySQL for persistence data, HashiCorp full through security store configuration, Elasticsearch, sets up a FAMP environment, uh, and spins up the FAMP runtime, and you're good to go. Like five minutes, and this will, depending on the connection to the Docker repos, obviously, but, uh, <laughs> Five to ten minutes and it should be running. And obviously later on you can go in and then can set up multiple organizations and environments and configure it any way you want. So that's really, really, you can go really all, all the way. But for this demo, let me show you uh, the basic. So we have these dependencies running. We have an organization and an environment. In Kubernetes, they was, this will be a namespace. In Marathon, it's a folder. Uh, it runs the gateway agent, which is uh, based on HA proxy. Who's familiar with HA proxy? So if you know ACLs, basically you can dive in and see the configuration generated, which is nice. You can open up the hood and see what it's actually generating and doing. Or even customize the templates. And there's a little workflow. We have a workflow agent, which injects an OGS script, understands FAM DSL and API, and can do all kinds of automation. This stuff is for our UI. It generates metrics for proxies. It measures the uh, scale of your cluster, so it can report on, on resources being used. Um, and it measures health stuff. So it can do all kinds of interesting stuff. And you can write your own and create and deploy them to FAMP. So this is it's running. I go into my FAMP. So there's a little UI here. The installer created the default role admin and a default user. Yes, this is the default environment. I can create my own roles for every environment, role-based access control, which is nice because maybe less technical roles you only want to allow to view stuff and not touch stuff. You can apply them to users or workflows and you can go into the environment. And this is the UI on top of the typical FAMP API. And there's two important things here, deployments and gateways. So um, I can deploy one container or multiple containers, total topologies, through FAMP. It will talk to the Kubernetes API or Marathon API. We'll make sure that everything is running and keeps it running like you described it. Um, or if I already have a deployment mechanism, like Spinnaker, GoCD, uh, GitLab, I can deploy through that mechanism and I can configure FAMP to listen for specific patterns like uh, container name, environment variables, labels, and then I can set, for example, like service name version and then FAMP will start configuring gateways and do the canary stuff. So either way you deploy through FAMP or outside <coughs> of FAMP, the canary features uh, still uh, are available to you. Will you also have a uh, CRD available? A CRD. Just a resource definition. I wouldn't know what it is. Um, I need to check. Can you write it down? Would that help you? 
We'll get back to you. Um. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Mark. <laughs> oh, well, we'll, I'll, we'll check. I, I don't just the answer already. It's uh, just so you can create any type of resource in Kubernetes and put on a controller on it, so it reacts on that one. Okay. Um, I don't know. Let, let me uh, let me check. So um, in this demo, um, I'm going to show you a little a canary release process automated, and um, we will um, uh, trigger a timeout issue with new version and do an automated rollback. Basically, it's showing you the safety net, which needs to be in place before you can start experimenting with features. Because nobody likes experimenting with features when stuff crashes and, and breaks. And uh, So first things first. So I just put a little general or JSON in here. I will show you. You can go into the website. We have tutorials which are a little bit more cleaner. Basically, it deploys two versions of the same container, but differently configured, and I'm putting a gateway in front so it can split traffic. So this thing will go here. It says deploying, and if everything goes okay, you should see stuff coming in the cluster. Everything happening in FAB is uh, stored in Elastic Indexes with timestamps. So every change you do, every commit, deploy, whatever. So it's an audit log, basically. If you can write a little Kibana or a query in, in Elastic, it's handy to see what happened. Who Broke shit. <laughs> um, let me go in. Two versions running. They're a little bit differently configured. And this one is more interesting. This one is configured to start throwing timeouts under a specific load. Probably familiar with this aspect. You, you thought you tested it all. It's being deployed and released, I should say, because it's a and then always at night. During the weekend, something, after a while, memory leaks, something fishy, patterns that you didn't predict, and it starts throwing errors, timeouts, and you are on call to go in and fix stuff. So that's kind of what we try to simulate here. So we have two versions running. I can go in. I can take a little look. Yeah, they're running. We see logs. Yeah, another one. So again, this is independent from Marathon or Kubernetes. This, this abstraction layer works on any scheduler, which is, in, for some people, really good to have. So we have these containers running with, with the shops in it. And obviously, I can show you. Port 950, here we are. And if I go to Gateway, I see basically 9050, which is my static external port, which is kind of like ingress in Kubernetes, you would call it. Like, where can I find this thing? And internal is where we do the load balancing and the canary routing. Um, so if I look here, and I need to move this back. Kind of this is how the UI uh, shows you how to generate these routing configurations. So 100% to the old version, no conditions. You can do all kinds of HTTP checks, sessions, cookies, headers, user agent strings. Um, so you can imagine you can do all kinds of conditional uh, routing, and or not. This co it hits condition first, then condition strength, and then the last thing is weight. So in this case, everybody lands on current version. Yeah. So far, so good. Um, and you see these metrics coming in. These are aggregated from the proxies. Uh, this workflow calculates stuff and then stores it in Elastic Indexes. And we can display it, or you can use it for scaling or uh, rolling forward, rolling back. So let me, and then manually, this would mean like, OK, I want to do a 50-50, or I want to do a step rollout. And you can basically grab this and do it manually, but obviously, we want to do this automatically. Uh, one thing, help. Anybody guess what this means? Green is good. Green is good. <laughs> um, interesting thing is that it's, it's a higher level metric that this workflow generates. And in this case, it's one, which is good. It's something between zero and one. Um, and it's an aggregate of percentage of healthy instances Readiness checks, I think, also, and 500 
issues on the gateway, or I should say 5xx issues. So the service can be ready, uh, healthy, green, but something in the logic can start throwing timeouts, then the help will drop. So it's, it's, it's a more like an aggregate thing that, that shows you the real health. And you can also pipe in metrics that are relevant for yourself, like the new relic stuff, <coughs> or app dynamics, Dynatrace, or anything that's relevant. Throw that in, generate that metric, and use it. So it's a nice high level thing that you, maybe it goes to, I don't know, 70%. 70% is in itself not maybe dangerous, but it, it gives an indication that something degrades. So uh, I'm going to spin up some traffic on this thing. Apache bench for the win. And let's see if we see the metrics coming in. It takes 10, it's a, there's a sliding window or, or the, a moving window that you can configure. Uh, yeah, there we are. So traffic coming in here. Everybody's landing in this version. Now we go to workflow. We have a little Node.js script that you can write yourself or you use the pre-baked ones. This one basically uh, does uh, increments in 5% from old to new while measuring the health. So if the health drops, it goes back immediately, it does roll back. Obviously, you can do retries if you script it that way, create Jira issues, report to Slack. Uh, it's really easy to do these things. That, that's the beauty. And a workflow is a scope, so you can write this Node.js script in your, uh, in your versioning system, push it to FAM, start it up, Chrome-based, daemon type, event-based, so it triggers on a specific event. So you can go really wild with this automation. This is a really basic one. Daemon type, I started, and let's Take a look. So the container, it will start a container, work for Canary. So it's like it's an autonomous agent. And if we take a look, it starts doing its magic. Normally you would do this over 48 hours or 24 hours or along your cycle list you want to measure. And after a little while, we should see traffic now coming in on the new version that's around here. And let's wait. Around 30%. Uh, which version is buggy? This one. Hola. Yeah. Question. <laughs> Suppose you already have something like Kubernetes running. When will be the moment that you say, okay, I need something like Spring? I will, uh, I will oh. answer that question. Uh, okay. Yeah, good question. So we see traffic on the, on the, on the buggy version, this one. And now we hit the point where it starts throwing 500 errors at some point. And we should see the help drop immediately to zero because that's how we scripted it. One 500 errors, no go. And there we are. Zero, and it did a rollback. Uh, will it try again? Hmm? Uh, will it try again to... Not in this uh, script, but that's kind of like two lines or three lines of, of Node.js script for yourself to do these rewrites, uh, retries. And, uh, yeah, obviously for us, it's important to deliver pre-baked uh, automation workflows for specific use cases. But in my experience, a lot of DevOps engineers, they know perfectly what they want. Maybe you want to restart something. If you it's depending on a service also often. Um, and um, so how you want to ha have it behave, that's up to you. You can also make it configurable in this script, basically, you see what's happening. After a while, it tries to retry again. And then, uh, and, uh, but how are you dealing uh, with um, data storage? So with databases and uh, <laughs> we don't. No, the the the, the thing with, um, with with data models or data structures, I guess that's what you're asking. If you do canary or any blue green, you need n minus n plus one backwards forward is compatible uh, in most cases. Otherwise, you need to solve it with <coughs> eventual consistency. So you can set the gateway uh, sticky, so it lands on a specific version or an instance. But if you start changing your data model, your, your underlying data model, you still need to find a mechanism to either do decouple it or, or, or handle that. So this. This typically is you start doing these things more around the edge where it's more stateless or where you have a more stable 
uh, either API or, or data model. And uh, uh, what about API uh, compatibilities? So if, uh, for instance, some uh, components um, uh, dependent on a specific version of other components? Yeah. You can split off traffic based on maybe an accept header or, or something, and then you say, okay, um, maybe you have a client that, that can move to a newer uh, backend API, but uh, other versions need to go to the old. Is that kind of the scenario that you're looking for? Mm. Uh, so I'm mainly wondering about uh, if uh, there are several components uh, inside microservices for yeah. instance yeah. and uh, some microservices will work fine only if other uh, component has specific version or something yeah like, like dependency chains yeah yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, typically what what you would do you add like a, what i call a magic header or <coughs> something that says this is a request that needs to have an, maybe a version of specific uh, services and then that is in a request and it will be forwarded by the services and that you can use as a condition to route traffic. Uh, so you mean that each component uh, must uh, itself check uh, if it's compatible with specific request or not? No, it needs to forward the, um, the, the headers in the request that, that you can use to add in. Because the routing you can do in the gateway condition, which is basically the proxy. So as long as this this header or whatever you use as a mechanism will be going coming in in the in the request from one service to the other, you could say okay we've got this accept header or uh, version. So uh, that part uh, you expect to be config configured on a routing uh, part of one. Um, so uh, to me, not uh, fully clear what you propose to do is. Uh, as it uh, dependency check. So, a as I understand uh, mm -hmm. what you said, that uh, uh, you want uh, on the routing stage uh, check if some field has specific versions and uh, it must go to yeah. this component, uh, and if it has uh, another version, it goes to different. Yeah. Component. Yeah. Okay. Does that answer the question? Mm, yeah. So far. Yeah. We can think of as well. Yeah, yeah, we, we can always talk a little bit uh, further. Um, I think 10 minutes left. 10 minutes left, yeah. Yeah, so one quick uh, uh, other thing I want to show you because this is like a technical thing, <coughs> what you also can do, and that's kind of nice, I think, is uh, use this for more like feature testing or AB testing. So, um, <coughs> let me get this thing here. This is a different deployment and it's kind of the same ish. It has two website front ends. And I need to wait until it's deployed. Yeah. Start it up. And they're configured to show different color scheme. And for one version, we also toggled something that an overlay will be shown and it asks the user do you like this new color scheme? We store that in a in data store, in this case Elastic. We write a little workflow that reads the incoming votes, and then based on number of votes and percentage of yes, no, it starts reconfiguring the routing. Say, so, okay, if enough people vote, I like this new color scheme, then we move everybody to this new color scheme. So you can start go going like feature toggling A-B testing territory, but fully integrated into your uh, deployment system. So I've got my shops up and running. And let me go here. Most, most people will go here. And, but if I'm a Firefox user, I go to this other version. So let's check. Here. Blue Firefox. Pinkish. Red, pink. And it will ask me, do you like this? Yes. I phoned a few times, do you like this? No. Do you like this? 
I'm playing different people here, so uh, multiple <laughs> personality. <laughs> um, and I will spin up this floating border flow, which, like I said, it will um, take a look at the folks coming in. So this floating goes outside of FAP and just stores it in an elastic index uh, somewhere. And then so <coughs> this floating the flow just uh, read uh, data from elastic and uh, do adjusting of uh, yeah. percentage. Yeah. So every workflow is an autonomous thing. It can have its own UI or dashboard even. So if I go in here and I see it has a little embedded uh, uh, let's see. Is my demo creeping out? No! You need to start to have a You can take your vote. No, I did vote. Anyway, this is a kind of a form configuration thing you can put in for the less technical people so they can grab slider and do stuff. And um, we have all kinds of checks here. Log, so let me check if everything is okay here. What does it say? Floats, <laughs> you have enough floats. Mm -hmm. uh, let me do one quick check. Of course, we also have a configured gateway to expose Kibana. I'll show you how it looks. It's very easy. Kibana, port 9050, map to an internal DNS thing. So you can also use it for easy PC uh, API gateway or exposing kind of things. So if I would check here, uh, on port 95, I should see something. We have a floating point. Let's test this. Let's try one more time. Ah, I think what happened. When I started the workflow, it was toggled to clear the index. And um, you're right, Nico. <laughs> I need to photo a little bit more. Yes. No. Very difficult. No, no, no. So let's check again in the workflow. Yeah, we have a yes vote, no vote. I think we configured it to go 70% yes, 30% no, a minimum of five votes, and then we move to the winner. So, um, yeah, let's go in here. And moving to the winner, that's actually, I think, did it already happen? Yeah. For quickness. I think it resets stuff. Anyway, the idea is, and then I'll wrap up because, uh, yet Moving to the winner is not stopping something and starting something. It's actually removing the condition, that Firefox thing, changing the weight balancing, and that's it. So it's more about moving traffic around. This is why we say releasing is really different from deploying stuff. Because everything is deployed, it's all running, but moving the traffic over stuff, that, that's where the magic lies to mm. start trying. Obviously, you can stop something after a while, maybe if your two major releases ahead, then makes sense to clean up resources. <coughs> and the same thing, but that's for later, if you're interested, we can write workflows for scaling based on latency, uh, all kinds of metrics. Uh, combine scaling based on canary releasing because you want to increase instances when you put more percentages on it, etc. So I hope this gave you a little bit of an idea. Um, and uh, yeah, we'd be happy to answer more questions. And Jetro is going to look, because he saw this and he said, this is interesting because I have some ideas on how to start testing with search engines and, 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 and how to make better search uh, experiences. Do I say it correctly? Yeah, of course. Yeah. And uh, I think he will show how that will work. So, uh, um, to try. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, we're really open to all kinds of ideas. Uh, uh, of course, we're hiring, as Nico said. Uh, so uh, we work in Ka at Scala. Uh, there's no JS, uh, Kubernetes, uh, Istio stuff, all the cool stuff. So uh, you know where to find us.
En dan ik dit kan zien, dat is verkeerd. Ja, ja. We, we eat every day like this. Every day. Ja, every day. Yeah, every day. <laughs> we have uh, so, so some questions with five minutes. En I want to hand out some nice uh, fan t-shirts for the best questions. Oh, yeah, yeah. so you guys need to uh, ask We can change the size as well. <laughs> any, any more questions? Can you do it to say you have like two data centers? Um, so, yeah, request comes in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you knew that, huh? Yeah, yeah oh, uh, T-shirt from. And my service on site on the data center is coming in. <coughs> if not available, it reroutes to the other data center. Yeah, possible. Yeah. Yeah. Um, like I said, it's it's multi multi mm -hmm. environment. You can configure them to run virtual clusters on hard clusters. And you can also pin them to data centers availability zones. So GDPR compliance, we're actually working with clients. Germany needs to be in German. And the thing is, all this data that you saw, it's not in FAMS domain. We're not SaaS. Yeah. You own the data. Cool. Uh, yeah. Another good question, worth a t-shirt. I guess your, your ass questions were... were <laughs> <laughs> you heard it anyway. <laughs> Any more? We have one I, had, I had a question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry. Yeah, so it was about uh, something with Kubernetes. No, when do you stop it? When do you take the moment? When do you ah. say I don't stop it? Yeah. Typically, when you have an application that is in some form serviced, and you can bake it into a container, uh, and you want to start, it's lifecycle management. So it's basically day two. The moment so you you need to upgrade, or you want to release in a more controlled way a new version instead of stopping and starting or doing in place upgrade then it starts being interest so you can do it more or less non-destructive so you yeah can, okay yeah like i said we wrap around stuff like load balancer in kubernetes or uh, uh, drop and replacement for marathon lb on on marathon so uh, yeah okay. this gateway basically sits in between how you normally uh, reach services with, yeah. with a service descriptor okay. yeah and it's as non-obtrusive as we can, can make it, basically. Yeah. <laughs> we have tutorials, so basically we explain how yeah. you could set it up. And if you're, you're running with Kubernetes or, or DCOS? Yeah, or I play, I play with it. Yeah, so typically yeah. when you can deploy to Kubernetes, you can add FAMP, and then from there we have tutorials how yeah. to start using the gateway in between. Yeah? What part of it will be open source, and what part will be really enterprise license? What you saw was the open core version. Yeah. So we have a single tenant, non-secured, uh, open source core, Apache 2.0, I think. Uh, and this is all um, the, the multi-tenancy lifter and stuff around it that's closed. So it's open core in that sense. Um, <coughs> we're not sure on, uh, we will maintain the, the open source core. And I can imagine that at some point we can, we want to slice out like a light version of, of stuff that makes sense <coughs> and, and provide this open source component. So, the sort of core is enough to play around and uh, get the red tie yeah. to uh, yeah. 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 yeah, this, this you can download or you can uh, go to the website, fill in the form, you get a 30 day <coughs> trial, which is fully like featured. You can deploy it, play around with it. If you don't like it, you throw it away again. Otherwise. And there's all kinds of, I like it, yeah. We're, we're kind of like turning the knobs and seeing what makes sense. <laughs> it's important to, to have like a solid business case. We understand that. So we're totally open enough in, in, in talking about it. I guess Nico and you, like the <laughs> more commercial people, uh, they, uh, they make sure that stuff will work for you and, and there's a business case. And, uh, yeah. But the thing is, I'm, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the Redis discussion on changing licensing models, yeah. how to make money with open source <coughs> software. We have are in the same kind of boat, and uh, we need to make money, obviously, to, to get nice food in. And uh, <laughs> So, yeah, we're, we're open for all suggestions and all uh, ideas there, always. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So and if, if you decide as a developer, well, I think this is great, by the way, I'm not sure whether you mentioned it, but on the website, we just released our new trial package. Yeah, so you can just do it uh, download. Uh, but if you come to discover like, ah, this is really cool. Uh, I have no idea how to convince my manager uh, to get any budget. <laughs> We've been here through this loop a few times. We have a full uh, Amazon time business case uh, on benefits and everything. So we can help you make the case if needs to be for, for the budget call. Uh, yeah, in the A-B testing scenario, yeah. you show that this integration where you 
store your data in your yeah. back end. Can you integrate that with additional analytic services yeah. and whatever? So if I want to force somebody to click on some links, yeah. for example, on that side of the yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, so um, page. yeah, FAMP is a fully yeah. Event, yeah. event API. So these workflows can either pull stuff <coughs> in if you have access from from, an, from ah, okay. so or you can send events and metrics to FAMP. Okay, so it's like a push or pull. Yep. So, so it's totally customizable. Yep. Yep. Okay. Yep. And every type of metric that you generate basically creates a new index and, and you can use it to trigger stuff. Mm -hmm. or, yep. It's more for aggregation, I thought of it, just in from yep. the aggregation <coughs> perspective. Yeah, it's really important because I think that you are often it's like aggregates of all kinds of stuff and then make. We talk a lot with companies that, yeah, we have all kinds of data sources, but how to actually <coughs> make use of it is. More like a harder yeah. issue. I thought from the perspective where you have, for example, a workflow for doing work within the application and you say you go through 10 steps, yeah. but then you want to simplify that and want to make sure that that works and you get yeah. the end result and you get it in three steps. Yeah. So that's something that requires aggregation through the whole pipeline. Exactly. Uh, yeah. <coughs> yeah. Yes, I think yeah. it's time for you. It's uh, time for uh, a 15, 20 minute break. break. We're uh, going to have some drinks. Yetro is going to get all set up. I've noted the people that have been asking questions before the t-shirt start. <laughs> and they will get the t-shirt. real question. But it wasn't cheating. You were the first. So thank you for your time, guys. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you.